All right. We're, we're live. And um, I'm not sure some people are going to hear audio only. Some people are going to be watching this on a YouTube channel. And this is my first time with a live with a video. It's not live video. It's live now in the moment that I'm saying it. Yeah. <laughs> That's not what live means. Okay, let me see if I can. <laughs> it's, the, it's the nerves, man. You got the camera on. It's yeah. How's it going, Jesse? Jesse Engel, it, thanks for joining. It's going me. pretty good. I mean, I realized, yeah, that we just uh, we just decided to do video, and I realized that you got the whole like Jimmy Kimmel cityscape behind you, and I just got like a blank wall. So I'm <laughs> yeah, gonna have to should... prepare or get a green screen for next time. They have but... like dinosaurs walking around in the background, <laughs> yeah, just stuff something, like that. Something yeah. to add some spark. All but... right. Well, we got Jesse Engel. Thanks for jumping on. Demetrius Gelat is here, and uh, I'll tell you what. This is uh, this is not really pool related, but I'll start by sharing. Uh, the meme that got me this week, uh, the only the closest thing to pool related it is, is that I saw it on AZ Billiards. Uh, for anybody that's not following the funniest picture thread on AZ Billiards, you're missing out. They've got the best memes of the world all at your at your uh, viewing pleasure. But this one, if I start breaking down into laughter in the middle of this episode, it's probably because of this. So you ready, Jesse? I'm going to put it on the screen. All right. Did you see that? Yes, this is boring. Sorry. <laughs> okay so apparently this is how i unfortunately how i get about a third or half my news is through i see a meme pop up i'm gonna wonder what this is about so for people that are not able to see this for people that are audio only uh bob jewett by the way shout out to bob jewett it's pretty cool um he's he's a big pool hall of fame like contributor you know as far as the physics of the game anyway boeing starliner astronauts stranded in space for 80 days will not return home until 2025 so this is the you know news story. Of course, these astronauts are going to be stuck in space longer than they expected. And somebody replied, humanity has about six months to purchase 8 billion ape costumes for the ultimate prank. And I don't cool. know, man. That one got me. Something about the idea. Okay, the scale of the trolling needed to yeah. make, make people think that they came back to a planet of apes in case anybody needs the joke explained. This eight is billion like ape, 8 billion ape costumes. The new so, age Truman show, man. Just oh, that's right. That's brutal. right. It's good. Like, what's going on here? So, all right. all right. So now that I got that out of my system, um, <laughs> what's uh, what's new with you in pool, Jesse? Are you have mm. you played at all? Are you playing in some some scotch doubles events, or are you just hitting balls at home, or what are you? Yeah, doing? well, I mean, just in the a little spare bedroom here, so about six, probably okay, probably ten feet away from me, I got my uh, nine foot diamond. But that's that's it, man. I just hit some balls there. I just got some new tips put on, so gonna be playing a little bit more in the next week or two to kind of wear those in but that's pretty much it i mean i don't really uh i don't really hit balls outside of my house these days it's getting tough I, i've been in that boat quite a bit lately whenever yeah. i that's another thing whenever i say the word boat i'm always afraid of my that's like the one word where my minnesota accent really shines through something oh, oh really extended yeah, yeah something about the boat but anyway yeah i'm in the same boat <laughs> i uh yeah i uh but but not always because tomorrow I am going to the Texas Open. Yay. So, um, yeah, you were asking, we were just talking about it. You were asking me, I'm actually driving down. So I'll probably leave tomorrow morning, six, seven in the morning. It's about a 17 hour drive to get to Austin or Round Rock, Texas. And uh, I'm, so I'm going to be doing the death drive and getting down there tomorrow, late like tomorrow night. I'm actually going to be staying with little Chris. And so that's going to be fun. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll hang out a little bit on Friday and then, uh, and then head over to Round Rock for the Calcutta, and then nice. I think play play a Saturday Sunday. Okay. So I'll be playing the event, and then on Monday, on Sunday night, I actually once the tournament's done, I'm done watching whatever, uh, done playing. I'm heading I'm heading over to Devin's place. Um, Devin, uh, he was he joined me for a podcast maybe two three months ago. Uh, mental game guy. Uh, he has the mental game uh, on Facebook. Uh, mental game management. Ooh, this is a terrible plug. Uh, I should pull it up. But anyway, um, he uh, I'm going to be going over to his house for three days and doing a three-day boot camp with him. So that'll be fun. So he's in Dallas. So on the way home, I'll, I'll stop by his place and do one of my three-day boot camps. And it's actually going to be at his place. So I'm looking forward cool. to that uh, quite a bit. So a fun trip. Yeah, that's good. And then I am not there. A lot of people have asked me. I'm not there for the one pocket because uh, it was a $1,000 entry in an extra four days. And I'm like, I just... Couldn't quite swing it, but um, I'm going to at least be able to play the nine ball. So that'll be fun. Yeah, it's a lot of time away to dedicate. So 
makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Have you played the Texas Open before or never made I have not. There? Never never been down there. So well, maybe one day. But yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a good tournament. Seems like it's uh quite a bit of money added, a lot of a lot of action. It's good. It'll be fun, man. Yeah. So yeah, and um what was I gonna say? But you know, this so this kind of reminds me there was one thing I was talking to a student of mine and I just I make notes about things I might mention on a podcast, and this is a very short note. Okay. But but it's a I think it's a good note. Go, when I say go solo, what I mean by saying go solo is not that you should go to all your tournaments solo. Yeah. But at the same time, you don't want your pool career to be contingent or conditional on somebody else's involvement or partnership. And I I don't think you've been as guilty of this in your pool career, so I'll ask you in a second. But for me, I know I love having a road partner. Like I love going to tournaments with you, whatever. I've gone to tournaments in the past with other players. And I like the, you know, the camaraderie and you're in it together, chopping the money and rooting for them and having someone root for you. Like I always kind of, I always kind of like that. But the problem with that is that if, if you're, if you don't have a road partner and then if you don't go to tournaments, then at some point you're kind of hanging your pool career on somebody else's participation. And so one thing that I wish I'd learned to do earlier, like I invited you to the Texas open. I would have loved, trust me, I would have loved for you to come. But when you weren't able to make it, like, I have a choice. Do I go on my own or do I not go? And in the past, I might have skipped the event. And and over the last few years, I've gotten better at kind of going on my own. And yeah, it's a little more expensive sometimes and put it whatever. But I'll tell you, at least it gets done. And it's like if for for people that are listening to this that are on the you know road on the pool road trying to get to more tournaments, trying to get into competition, don't make the mistake I made, which is for too many years I missed too many events because it wasn't convenient for you know, the whole committee approval, you know, uh, just, you have to get to them. And, and if, and if that means going solo to get the number of opportunities you need, then go solo because you got to get in the ring. What do you, you've done pretty well with that over the years though. How, what was your experience with that? Has that ever burned you or? Yeah. I mean, well, you and I have talked about this a little bit, I guess, with the idea of, uh, you know, go like you and I have been to a lot of tournaments where we just, for our own reasons, we've just decided to, you know, just kind of chop everything because it just makes sense. Then it makes, you know, you're not like rooting for or against the person. And then when you run into each other, which seems to happen every tournament we go to, <laughs> then we don't have to like have that awkward uh, thing. But yeah, I mean, I don't know. I'm uh, I'm a little undecided about that because I mean, I, I do think it's good. You got to be able to do both. You have to be able to head off and go by yourself. Um, I mean, I've always been kind of that way anyways, where I'm just like ready to kind of get in there and kill so i'm like i'm good to just kind of go solo but i feel like you know going like you and i like how we go to tournaments together there's times where i feel like the one part that i miss out on is like the extra little bit of hunger where like it's all on me not to say that that like takes away from my my game at all but i feel like you you kind of know in the back of your mind that you have that that like extra piece of padding you know what i mean like you're like you have two horses in the race and it's, it, it's like a, I know that that took me a little while to get over a little bit mentally. You know what I mean? I don't know if that makes sense to you at all. Oh, but yeah, for sure. It's and it's like, weird, you know, sometimes people feel, you know, some people feel the opposite. I've had a lot of people that tell me that their best pool, a lot of people tell me their best pool is in team events um, yeah. or playing in events where they feel other people are counting on them. Um, and so that that's what makes them try the hardest when they're playing on their own. Maybe they don't fight as hard or whatever. So it, it's all, you have to look at what works for you, obviously. Um, but then, and part of it too, is could also just be like the reasons why we're playing, you know, and, and why are we going to these tournaments? So there might be tournaments where if it's just a matter of like, do I really want to go out to this tournament and grind for two days and stay up late in the night? And it's not really about money. And it's, if I win, it wouldn't be the biggest tournament I've won. So it doesn't really, you know, inspire me to like, it's not like a life changing thing. Um, does that sound like fun? Maybe, maybe not. But, but if it's me and you, where I know that we get to hang out, the car ride is going to be fun. We're going to be joking around in the hotel and playing poker at two in the morning for stakes. We shouldn't touch, you know, whatever. It's like, you know, like all that stuff. It's like, well, that sounds now all of a sudden it's like a little vacation and fun. So, so there are tournaments that might not make my list, except that it would be fun to go play with you. Uh, but then again, then there's tournaments that, you know, you just want to go play. And, you, and I think that, um, so you got to know, you got to know yourself. I just know that for, for a long time, I, I probably missed out on opportunities because I was almost waiting for, you know, you know what it reminds me of is, um, I was, I guess now that I say this, I realize this is like a public confession that I'm a nit, 
there was a lot of times when I wouldn't like to get into action unless somebody else was in on it with me because I wanted somebody else to think I could win. I don't know if you've ever had that before where it's like, I don't know, man. I don't know if I want to play that guy. And somebody's like, no, you got this, man. I'll take half. I'm like, all right, well, if, if you're betting on me, then I guess I, you know, I like it. Yeah, that's fair. But I was, you know, that's, it's like in the end, I probably lost a lot of money by waiting for somebody else's permission to win a match. <laughs> and yeah, uh, I think that's uh, just a quick side note on that. I think that uh, it's, see, pool for me, it's, it's like a, the reason, a lot of the reason why I was drawn to it is like when I was like growing up in, in school and stuff, I did play some team sports and I used to get like outrageously frustrated because my level of competitive, like was so high and I could tell that people on like the team, they were not that they were forced into it, but they just, their heart wasn't like fully in it. Like in that moment, their, their like mood in their life did not like rely on the win or the loss, you know? And like, to me, like, that's what that, it meant everything in that moment, even if it was not that big of a deal, but that's just how I treated competition. So like with, for me, that's where like, I was able to finally like, you know, have an outlet with pool. So, I mean, it's interesting because yeah, like you said, everybody has their own way to, to kind of view that and it, different things work for different people. But I will say, I feel like for me, you have to like, like you have to be able to do everything by yourself in pool across the board. And that includes putting yourself in the, in the box, whatever that means for you and just being okay with the idea that like you might be stepping out of your, your league a little bit, but you're willing to like die on that sword. You know what I mean? But with no support, like that's such an important, uh, like it's just such an important uh, thing that you have to have as a pool player. I think, you know, that I, builds, I was thinking the same thing. Inside, so, yeah, I was thinking the same thing. Like when you're competing, I mean, you know, you could play in a team, you could go to a tournament with somebody else, but in the end, eight, you, you know, you could have, you could have, you know, you could have a significant other texting you, encouraging messages, or you could have a bunch of people liking your journey on Facebook or all this stuff. But in the end, it's like you, the table and your demons and your opponent. And that's like, you, there's nobody can help you. Nobody can help you. <laughs> you're on your own. And when you're, yeah. when you get like an hour before a match, and, you know, the person you're at the tournament with is like, they're already eliminated and they're just hanging out meeting up with friends they haven't seen for a while or watching pool. And you're the one sitting in the hotel room getting ready to play some 800 Fargo that's about to try to kill you. And you're like, okay, how am I going to do this? You know what I mean? And it's like, well, how are you going to hold it together? And, you know, how you, you know, are you really, how do you get yourself, I mean, you know, doing that little pre-match check? Like, I'm, I know I'm nervous. I'm always nervous. Is this a good nervous or a bad nervous? And if it's a bad nervous, how do I turn that around and kind of like, am I ready to face this? And what am I going to run into and how am I going to handle it? And just when you're in that spot, man, I mean, you know, there's just, nobody can help you. You just, so, so doing it on your own and just going on your own to where it's like, there's no pretense. There's no pretense that this is some team effort. Like I'm going, I'm in my car for 17 hours. I'm going to go down there. I'm going to get in the ring and you know, whatever happens happens, but it's like, it's like there's no pretense that there's any kind of a team. It's just, you know, cage fight. Yeah, I agree. Cool. cool. Yeah. And, yeah. Anything else you wanted to add or is that? No, no. Yeah, I was just thinking of examples of it. Like I was just, you know, it's just interesting. I mean, I don't want to start like speculating on which players, but just like, you know, it's like when you watch like Shane, when you can tell when he's like really in his zone. It's like when he misses, he's not there's it's like he's not angry. Like I'm embarrassed that people just watch me miss. He like actually, you could just tell he's like, he takes it personally. You know what I mean? And it's, it seems like the very like introverted guys, which there's a lot of those in pool seem to like do better with, with that side of pool. You know what I mean? Whereas like yeah. a guy, not, not saying this is Earl's problem, but like, it's like Earl relies so much on like his surrounding. It seems like nowadays where if everything's not kind of clicking and, and pushing in his favor, then like it's a lot easier for him to, to fall apart when, when a few mistakes start happening. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, he's having a, a shared experience as opposed to an independent. Exactly. You know, who yep. else you mentioned, you mentioned uh, Shane, of course, uh, you know, who else strikes me as like a real solitary and there's a number of people, but like, you know, John Mora always struck me as that way. You know, you can tell it's not just how they play at the table. It's also like in between matches and like, you know, they're just, there's some people that want to go to the bar and be the life of the party. You know, Jason Shaw is like a social kind of guy. And yeah, I mean, that's not a judgment. He's a great guy. But there's certain people that are just like, they go there, they do their thing. They're very kind of, they're very much on their, you know, on their own path. And uh, anyway, uh, it's not one that's right or the other. But the point is, you have to be able to go on your own path because, you know, no matter how many friends you show up with, at some point, it's just you and the table and you got to, you got to walk your path. Yeah. And then and clearly the guys, anybody else, they're going to, you don't want anyone to be an anchor to Selena. Go ahead. Yeah. And I was just going to say, clearly the guys at the way top, like 
they've somehow found a way to like be able to be so good at the at the important side of that but then like when it comes to like the surroundings the environment the crowd they're just like it's like it just complements it perfectly for them you know it just get, boosts them one step higher it seems like and that, i mean that's obviously why a lot of the reason why they're so good but it's uh yeah it's just interesting i feel like a lot of people don't really uh put a lot of thought into that stuff you know because you don't notice like what environments you're good in what what, what you're you know until you get to a higher level because you just assume you're just making mistakes for whatever reason but yeah anyways. it's like a coincidence that i always play bad in certain spots or yeah well like i mean for how many years did Shane struggle overseas right i mean yeah he, at home in the u.s he won five u.s opens and he was like almost unbeatable but when he went to like overseas world championships in qatar or something like that he he it took him a lot of years and even still um you know i would say that the vast majority of his success has been in the usa um but of course the vast majority of his play has been in the usa I, anyway i don't want to get into the data the point is it, even a guy like Shane, you know, it might have taken some adjusting to learn to play right. in international audiences where he's not the poster boy for the U.S. representing his country. He's now, you know, whatever. So, yeah. Yep. Cool. Okay. So topics. Well, first of all, I uh, I mentioned it, but I do want to plug my boot camp. So for first time listeners or viewers, I get to say viewers now, or for people that have been tuning in with me for this whole painful four and a half year journey. Um <laughs> I teach pool. <laughs> Are you thinking about the gorilla costumes again? No. Oh, okay. God, it's the four and a half year journey. I'm like, man. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, I've been doing these boot camps. Three days. Okay, uh, three days. Come come to my place, fly in, train up, run out. There you go. That was my, I, when I when I used to think about having a, low, a, a motto, it was going to be fly in, train up, run out. I thought because the fly in and then run out like you're running out of rack. Anyway, <laughs> so uh, it's fun, you know, uh, you can email me or find out more information. I'm at MN for Minnesota, mnpoolbootcamp.com. And you can email me at info at mnpoolbootcamp.com. And basically, uh, yeah, we're going to, we're going to look at your game. I think that, you know, one thing that I do pretty well is that I think there's a lot of instruction online. <laughs> I think there's a ton of instruction online. There's a ton of information. It's information overload. There's more information about pool online at this point than anybody could ever watch. Uh, not to mention all the pro matches and all the stuff you could watch. And so what I try to do is I'm like a missing piece guy and a, and a put it all together. Look at the front of the puzzle box kind of guy. I feel like you get all these pieces here and you get all these pieces here and you watch these guys and you pick up a few things and you watch these videos and you pick up a couple things and then it runs through your understanding and technique and you interpret that in a certain way. And then you try to put it together in a certain way. And when you show up here, I can just look at it and say, great, we've got all these pieces. And these whole pieces are assembled right. And these pieces you've already developed, they're just not quite there, put together the right way. And then these pieces you're kind of missing. So let me show you what it should look like. And then let's work on a couple missing pieces and then groove those together with those other pieces you kind of have and smooth it all out. And then I not only, so whatever we're working on something, we're not just like, oh, this is just one thing we're working on. You should also understand how that fits into the vision of how you can play and how you want to play. And so I think I do a pretty good job of the forest and the trees helping people see where they're at in their pool game, what their pool game could look like with the right tools as added and the right you know pieces and assembled correctly, seeing how that could come together, like what that road looks like. Here's the pieces we want to develop. Here's how we want to put them together. And then actually feeling that a little bit, working on those things and then developing it to where when they leave here, they're already playing better. They've got more tools and they're playing a smoother game as well as having some stuff to take home and continue to go on that journey on their own. So that's what I do. And, um, look me up. I've got a couple openings left before year end. Uh, last time at this year, I was booked until, you know, through the end of the year, but right now I still have a couple slots open. So, uh, I, after January, for some reason, I always get busy at the beginning of the year. So anybody looking to get in before the year end, hit me up. Very good. Thank you. All right. Let's see. Okay. Let's talk sharking. Let's get, you know, enough of this. Let's talk about sharking. All I had right. a quest. I had a question emailed in. Yeah. So I've had time to think about this. You haven't. I get to put you on the spot. When he's playing a match, sometimes when his opponent is getting very upset with themselves, it, it, it can disrupt him or distract him or interfere with his performance. So like, for example, if his opponent scratches on a shot 
and then they pick up the cue ball and slam it or bang their cue on the table and they start beating themselves up. Or if a guy misses a, misses a, a you know, their last object ball on a rack of eight ball, and then they just, you know, just, just whack the table with their cue and shaking their head and swearing at themselves out loud. And they're just steaming when they go back to the chair. Sometimes that would like, all of a sudden he's at the table and it's like, it disrupts him a little bit. What are your thoughts on like, why does that happen? Or does that, how do you, how do you not let that affect you? Or, or is that possible? Uh, yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't know if it's co- possible to like completely not let it affect you. I guess there's different levels to that too. Like, like how obnoxious the person's being, right? So there, there's a guy that will like, yeah, it's like he gets frustrated because he clearly sees the cue balls rolling, you know, towards the side or the corner or whatever, picks it up. And like you said, just kind of like does the smack down on the table and like, are you kidding me? Or just, just says some other choice words and then just like walks away kind of angry, right? But then there's the guy that will do that and then continue to like mutter stuff under their breath or like do all this flailing arm stuff, slam their cue and like continue while you're like, now it's technically like your time at the table. And then it's like, well, how do you really like focus while now you're like, is this guy going to stop? Like, what is he going to, you know what I mean? So there's like, there's multiple layers to that, I feel like. Um, but just in general, I would say the way that you, again, it's going to be different for everybody, but this is like part of the mental preparation where you have to like, you have to understand that like the way that you're viewing pool is about um, it's, it's like a very uh, like, you got to look at it almost like you're just doing like transactions with the game itself. Like you're not really there to like this. Oh, like this is my, my uh, opponent, John over here, you know, like this is who I'm, it's like, no, that's just the guy who ha- happened to show up that you're matched up with in the tournament or, or whatever. If, even if it's a league, it doesn't matter. Like it's cool to be like, friends with people or whatever or acquaintances but like when you're there like that person is you you basically have to just view them as like they're not a human being they're just not i know it's easier said than done but that's just the way i feel like you you have to try to push towards so how that works for each individual i'm not sure i mean it's a lot easier for me to tap into the the more like narcissistic side of a a brain than maybe most people but i feel like that's where you like you have to work on with that in the end goal or you know like work on developing the point where you just have so much killer instinct that the other player doesn't matter. What they're doing doesn't matter. And I don't know. I mean, I I don't know how to like tell somebody how to do that. I'd have to kind of like treat it case by case and, and really understand like what, you know, what's going on in their brain. But yeah, that, that's my like quick take on it, I guess. If that that makes sense. Yeah. So I'm all about treating people as like NPCs. Like, like it's just, I'm the only person that's real in this computer game. And these guys are like, that's why when I played poker, I like to play online poker. It's like, I didn't want to sit next to real people. I just wanted blinking avatars where it's like, yeah, you know, so, you know, high roll of 74 or something. I'm like, that's all I want to look at, you know? And so in my mind, I think that's, that's pretty good advice is like, this is not a, this is not a social game at the heart. I mean, it could, maybe it is for some people, but it's, it's really a game of solitaire. And so that's. Yeah. Good- and the other thing I was going to say is like, there's a, with that too, like, so when, when they, they say like, when they see the frustration that, that affects them, like you have to understand that like at the, at the root of that, there is a, a portion of like empathy there, which is why that affects you. Right. Um, and, and in my opinion, like as long as you're like acting and playing with a, uh, in a way of like high integrity towards the game itself, like other than that, like empathy, has, there's no place for empathy in pool. Like you can't feel bad because you hit a ball and like, it wasn't the exact way you thought you were going to get safe, but you ticked off a ball. I mean, I know that it's like standard for players to put up the hand of apology. That's just like, nobody's actually sorry about that. Like nobody, I've, I've There's never, nothing actually, that makes me happier in the world. Yeah, I've never seen like a professional player walk away with like a $30,000 check and then still be like, t- just like t- in tears. Just like, I, can't, me I can't believe how lucky I got. They're just, they just do that just to try to try to save face is all it is. Like nobody's actually sorry about a bad role. So it's just, let's just, <laughs> I mean, they're not, you know, like you're just not. Yeah. So. You know, there's, and there's certain people, there's certain people that I really wish I had the role saved up for. There's certain people that it hurts them so much when I get a good role on them. That I'm just oh, like, for oh, sure. Man, I wish that had happened again. So, and so, but anyway, yeah. so, okay. So here's, here's what you started to touch on. Cause I think there's a couple of questions. One is why does this happen? And then the other question is, what do you do about it? And so you're saying that one reason why this happens is that some people might be too empathetic to their opponents or they're like, they feel like you're the one causing them pain or something like that. I've never felt that way. I guess I'm off the pool table. I tend to be like, I'll, I'll help a little old lady across the street or I'll, you know, lend you the, you know, whatever, lend you a, a shirt on if you need a shirt off my bag or whatever. But like, 
when we're at the pool table, somehow I, I've always been fortunate enough. So I can't say if this is healthy or if it's right or if you should emulate this, but like I've always fed on my opponent's suffering. Uh, it's like, it's like, look, we're in a fight. We're trying to inflict, we're trying to, you know, we're trying to get a job done. And there's times when the other guy is just hammering through racks and you're just feeling like nothing's working and you're feeling kind of like, like you're on your back. And then there's other times when you're doing it to the other guy. And to me, it's like, yeah, I'm trying to play the table, but I'm also, if I can get my opponent into a spot where they're breaking down and spewing off opportunities out of tilt or despair, I just feel like that's, that's awesome. Like that's, let's keep it going. Let's pour gas on that fire. So, so for me, that's always fueled me, not hurt me. Um, I guess maybe that's because it doesn't really, I think the reason why I'm trying to rationalize why I'm not just the worst human in the world is that I don't feel like I'm, it's almost like, I feel like there's a mature mindset in which you handle things and that when you handle things maturely, when you make mistakes, you're not supposed to, you know, it's, you're not supposed to let that get to you. And so if somebody's in a mindset to where their mistakes are really getting to them, it's almost like if a, it's like if a six-year-old is, is at a store and they're really whining a lot to their mom and they're, and they're knocking cans off the shelf at the grocery store and they keep trying to put cookies in the cart and their mom is just like, you know, if the kid acts like a sufficient brat at some point, you know, if the mom's, you know, I'm not going to say hits the kid, that's getting a little darker than I wanted to get. But at some point when the mom addresses it or the dad addresses it, you're like, good, good for them. Like it's about time they, you know, put their, you know, put the smack down on this kid a little bit, and put them in place. And it's not because you don't like the kid. You just don't like the way the kid's acting. And I guess I feel like when people are pouty and whiny and smacking tables and throwing up their arms, I just think that's so unprofessional and so uh, immature that I feel like they deserve what, like the pain that they're experiencing is like, that's for their own good to like quit acting like that. You know what I mean? I like, I don't know. So for me, I'm not, it's not that I hate them. I just don't like them when they act that way. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good way to put it. I was going to say like, there's another part to it too. So, I mean, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm like guilty of this very often, but there even now, like there's times where like I'll play and I'm just like, I'm not in it mentally. And like, I'm susceptible to kind of like, giving into that side of myself you know and it's like it's not not to be like proud of it but it's just like i'm a human being you know i'm gonna have other stuff going on in life whatever but i think a good way to start like getting over this if like for that person emailed in i'm not I'm not gonna assume that this is their issue but if you are a type of person that like when you're playing pool and you're getting potentially bad roles yourself and that like that really affects you in a negative way. Like you can just feel it in your body and you're like, you're in you know, negative mindset. You just assume that it's not going to work out, whatever it is. I think that that's like a really good place to start because if you're having those like roller coaster emotions about the, the, you know, the short term, like outcomes in your own, like run out or your game, whatever it is, then you're going to be more susceptible to that when your opponent reacts to that, because you're like in th you're you're already so used to going into like these ups and downs with you know with the game that when you see that like any little thing can kind of set you off you know what i mean so like it, again it's it's not really like a human way to look at the game but like at the end of it like the logical most logical approach is just to understand that whatever happens on every single shot is 100% your fault like good or bad it's your fault and yes there's those occasional times where like you hit the ball perfect. The ball is rolling at the last second. It like either hits a chunk of chalk or kind of rolls off because the table's on level or bounces but, out of the back of the pocket. Yeah. Yeah. But, or something like, yeah, yeah. But like, but, but there's also the other way to look at that, which is like, all right, well maybe the ball did roll off, but you know what? Like I played a run out or I left myself it, the shot before, you know, where I had to roll into that position. And yeah, even though I didn't know that the table was on level, like, this is just the, the natural variance of the game. So like trying to like continuously work in your mindset and understanding that like, as you get better, you're going to deal with less and less of these uh, like unforced errors, whatever it is, but no matter what, no matter how like bad or good you are, just understand that it's for the most part, all your fault and just be okay with that. And the goal it's, should be yeah, yeah. to have everything go better and better. And then just be okay with the fact that, well, I'm getting better because this is all my fault. You know? So I think I, I think I know. Let me see if I'm right about what you're saying because sure. yeah, 
what I hear is, is that, so I teach mental game, by the way, uh, you can check it out info <laughs> or mnpoolbootcamp.com. I'm probably going to do one more mental game course this year. One more group. Uh, I've done probably three this year and I'm doing one more. So email me if you want to jump in. It's pretty, pretty cool. Uh, just wrapped up the last one. But anyway, basically I talk about two mindsets. You got the mature and the immature mindset. Um, and it's almost like to use an example of uh, like poker, you know, there's now not every professional poker player has a professional, but my opinion of a professional mindset, of course, but there's like a couple different mindsets you have when you play cards. One mindset is, you know, like, man, when the good cards come, that's great. Yay. That's so lucky. And when the bad cards come, oh man, that's so unlucky. That's terrible. And you're just riding these huge emotional roller coasters with every time the cards get dealt. And some people like it that way because they enjoy the roller coaster ride and whatever. For me though, um, I always like the mindset that's more like we're, if we're professionals, like we do this for a living, we do this every day. Like when a casino owner is watching their black deck, blackjack dealers deal cards, they they deal thousands and thousands of hands a day. And so there's a lot of lucky things that happen and a lot of unlucky things that happen. And as a casino owner, they don't care about, you know, if this one guy made his double down, like if they get really, really lucky or if they hit a 16 against a dealer's, five and they're not supposed to and then they hit the perfect card and the guy wins a hundred dollar bet it's not like the casino owner's like oh man that's so unlucky it's like he doesn't care because they see a they see fifty thousand hands a day and they're making you know fifty thousand you know they're making you know two hundred thousand or five hundred thousand dollars a day or however much they make and so it's like in the end they they're professionals the casino owner is just managing this they're making sure that the processes are right that they have the right dealers they're trained the right way and so they're not rooting they're not rooting up there in the camera room for this guy to bust on his 15 they don't really care they're just like deal the cards out play by the rules try to make sure we have the processes that we can control are running right and the the ebbs and flows will take care of itself and i'm not going to get too emotional about any one hand whereas the players are sitting there like every card is like oh my god that was awesome oh that's terrible and they're going through these roller coasters so to me when i don't really i'm not like going through a roller coaster kind of guy i'm kind of like the guy that's trying to be just so at where this comes in with pool, you know, we've talked about process and results. And, and so when I'm playing pool, I'm trying to just do my job and do the best I can to prepare and do the best I can to compete. And in the middle of all that, there's going to be times when my performance has little spurts where it looks really good. And there's going to be little spurts where it looks pretty bad. And there's going to be wins and losses. And there's going to be things that happen that look really fortunate, things that happen that look really unfortunate. But in the end, it's like, those things will ebb and flow and my results will ebb and flow. But that's just this merry-go-round going around in the background. I'm just trying to focus on good decisions, good effort, you know, good preparation and and just being aware of where I'm at. And if something's on fire, trying to put it out and do my best to keep going. So, okay. What does this have to do with what you said? So I think there's a couple mindsets. And I think that when a person is in kind of a mature mindset where they're just trying to play their best game, And then they see somebody else going through this emotional roller coaster about like, oh no, maybe they get drawn into that a little bit. It makes it a little harder for them to, they're so, they're trying to be process focused. This other guy is so result focused that it's easy to distract them and get them hung up on results. Is that what you were saying at all? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Yep. And then, I mean, yeah, essentially, yes. I was just also going to say that like, I mean, yeah, I, I don't really articulate it the best probably, but when I I kept kind of saying like, you know, just understand it's all your fault more. So like, I guess another way to put this would be like everybody's results oriented to a certain degree and more so in the beginning. Right. Unless you've had like severe mental training in some other aspect in your life. Like it's just natural. It's how it's going to be because you're excited that you're like, Oh man, I can make the balls do this. And wow, I can run out balls now, whatever. But I would say like the, the thing I'm really trying to get across is that you can't really allow yourself to get, too discouraged or too excited so like just understand that like whatever's happening it's like it's in your control is the point and when really good things happen it's okay to like have a sort of a sense of like being proud of yourself but like you can't completely allow your mood to to change and your view on on how you're playing or everything because that's there's too much variance in that you know and and nobody's ever going to play a perfect game I mean, even when you watch the the best players that we have access to watching, you know, like they have days, it's like you'll watch a miscue and do something really where you're just like, how does that even happen? You know, or the, I mean, we've seen it, you know, so it's like, and and I can promise you those guys are not doing that. 
and then going back to their chair and just be like all they want to do is throw their cue across the room they're just like well they just understand it you know like this is it sucks but this this is part of it you know so yeah and anybody in that chair they've they've miscued and choked more times than anybody else in the world you know that's how they got there so yeah um, so and so yeah being 100 percent accountable and, and and trying to keep going back to your process and not getting too hung up so let me my thought because i had a time to think about this a little bit and I, you know i'm not starting over on this question from the beginning but i do think that um when I was thinking about how does, why does this affect people for somebody to be slamming their cue? It's their cue. What difference does it make if they slam it? But I think it does pull people out of the process and into the results in the following way. I think, okay, let's talk about an ultimate sharking trick. That's not allowed is that when you're playing and you're getting ready to shoot a money ball, it's against the rules for somebody to like unscrew their cue. Why is it against the rules for somebody to unscrew their cue when you're shooting the money ball, Jesse? Well, I mean, obviously, it'd be a distraction, you know. Yeah, that's, because that's the main thing. Why would it be a distraction? I mean, it's, <laughs> it's just let's just spell it out for people that haven't thought it through. Sure. Well, it's it's a distraction because either one, like the noise itself, like if somebody is behind you, whatever, or if you notice that they're doing that, they've already essentially conceded the match. So in your mind, even though you haven't pocketed the ball yet, you're like, oh well, well, they're they've clearly already decided that we, we've. Like we we've already agreed that I've won the match or I've won the game, so that's where we're at. But it's just like we haven't vocalized it or whatever, so that it's just yeah, it just leaves this awkward position. But yeah, that's so why it's meant to be. So for lot. for just a one hundred one sharking technique, when somebody's shooting the money ball and you start unscrewing your cue, what you're basically saying is, oh man, I've lost. I can put away my cue because obviously you've won, but I haven't actually said that's good. I haven't conceded. So what if you're the one at the table shooting the money ball, you're like, oh, he's breaking down his cue. It looks like I got it. Oh, but I still have to shoot it. But he's and it and it takes people out of the moment because it gets people thinking about like, oh, I guess I won. Oh, but I still have to shoot this ball. It takes them out of the moment. It gets them thinking about results. That's why it's sharky. I know a guy I used to gamble with that would do the same thing. He would pull out money like he was getting ready to pay off, you know, before he shot the money ball, but he's not conceding. It was obviously like the most blatant sharking of all time. Um, so here's what you need to know. When somebody's banging their cue against the table and getting all despairing, I think it's a sharking, whether it's intentional or not, and I'll go into that, but like it's a sharking maneuver where they're acting defeated. They're acting defeated. And so then there's a part of you that's like, oh man, this guy is like completely the wagons came off, the wheels came off the wagon. Looks like I've got it made from here. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, but now I still have to run out. But he's acting like I already won, but I still have work to do. But like, can I... And it just takes you out of the moment. And so I've got, man, there's, there's the best, uh, there was a, uh, well, I've been using poker analogies. There's a poker book by Mike Carroll uh, about live tells and like ways to read how strong or weak your opponent is. And the moral, like if you had one thing that you've learned from that book, did you ever read that book, Jesse? I didn't No. His book of tells in the end, he basically, he, he, this was probably in the eighties or nineties. He wrote this, in, you know, whatever. And eighties, probably it, it was the one that really solidified the saying weak means strong and strong means weak. And what he said is at the poker table, if somebody ever acts really strong, that usually means they're weak. And if somebody's acting really weak, that usually means they're strong. Now it's not always that, you know, that transparent, but, right. in, but in general, people are at, in poker, it's deception. You're trying to deceive your opponents. So you try to act in ways to deceive your opponents. Now, he made one very important clarification, which is if it's acting, if it's something that if it's behavior that people know that they're doing, where they know they're being watched, then you can basically reverse what they're doing. But if it's something that somebody's doing subconsciously or that they don't think people are seeing, then it's probably telling the truth. So if, they're, if their body language is weak, that might be the truth that they're weak, but if they're putting their chips in, you know, in, in a really quiet, passive way, that might be more of a tell because they're acting. So anyway, the point is what I've learned, how this tests the high in the pool. Well, I've learned one thing. If they haven't conceded, they are actually doing their absolute best to win. So if somebody is banging the table and acting all defeated, they may not know this, but in their history of playing pool, they've probably successfully, even if they don't think they're doing it as a shark, 
it's probably rattled enough opponents and gotten them extra opportunities to where somehow in their reptilian brain, they've recognized that acting in that way seems to reward them with more chances than they should be getting. Yeah. And so, so somehow, whether it's like, I'm going to act defeated to best this guy up. I don't think they're thinking that. I just think that they've had a lot of experience where acting really, really defeated and weak somehow they get more chances after that. And that's, they're, they're actually doing that in a desperate attempt to win. And so I know a guy that whenever I had him, like when I would get him really far down on the score, suppose he's down four or zero in a race to seven and I play a safe instead of getting up and like lining up the kick and trying to make good contact, he would literally just walk up, get down one stroke, the ball air ball, the thing and just wave his hands like, ah, well, uh, you know, I, what am I, you know, you just, you got me, you know, he, he might even say you've got me, or you might just be like, yeah, you're playing great, man. Keep it going. You know, he's doing all this stuff. And, and he would just act like he doesn't even care. Yeah. And if he had a tough shot in the one, he just get down and fire at it. And well, I missed and I guess I got no chance. <laughs> but then as soon as you started thinking, Oh, I'm up for nothing. And he's completely given up. And then all of a sudden you get a little complacent because then you don't check your angle and you get funny on the seven ball and you jar it because you got straight in. And next thing you know, he's all of a sudden he's trying to run out really hard. And it's like, wait a minute, you were just acting defeated a second ago, but now I missed the seven ball. And now you're going to try to claw your way back in. And so I learned that from him. And what I learned is no matter how weak he acts, that is in his mind, there's as long as, until he concedes, until he says, that's good. We don't have to finish the set. You win until he concedes the set. What he is, whatever behavior he is doing is actually his very best attempt to win the set that he knows how to do. And if he's getting yeah. down on one stroking that kick shot, he's made the calculation that giving me ball in hand there is worth it if he can shark me in the moment. And so whatever he may look, however weak he looks, this is actually his best attempt to, to, to win the set. And once I learned that, then when an opponent started acting weak like that, I would just be able to say, great. You're, 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 you're actually sacrificing equity, trying to get me overconfident or derailed or out of the moment. So all I have to do is keep staying in the moment and you keep giving me ball in hand and air and one stroke in your kicks. All I have to do is know that this is a move and keep doing my best. And then I'm just picking up equity and I'll take it all day long. Yeah. That's funny. No, that it is funny. Cause when you think back to like how many times that's happened to you, or maybe if you've ever done anything, that's like was sort of subconscious towards that level it's it is kind of funny to think about i, I what do you were when we started talking about this i thought about uh i don't know if you remember this do you remember when we went to like the last time they had the bar table championships out in uh vegas what's uh with uh do you Skyler. want to mention his name Skyler. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no he wouldn't care if he would no this no, was no, yeah. this was very interesting man yeah that's you i gotta tell him for the story because this one's pretty funny dude I I, yeah I mean, very good it example. got me it definitely got me and i like i didn't realize it in the moment but it gladly it didn't affect the match but so it was bar table nine ball i mean you already know the story but so i'm it was a alternate the break with the magic rack and i was up seven to zero and he had like screwed up after his break oh, uh nine. Did, he oh, like nine. hooked himself you know and again you know i technically i still gotta win two more games and i'd been playing like a, a like a okay pace you know not like ultra slow but definitely not just like running out his speed you know he I mean he flies around the table so like it, you know, when I'm up seven zero, I'm like, whatever. And I'm like running through this rack and I get to like where I think I got to like the seven ball where there was like three balls left. And then I was like, I'm, I'm doing my thing where I kind of walk around the table, just double check the angles. I mean, I don't want to screw anything up here. I'm trying to play perfect pool. And then he kind of like, I don't know, he's kind of like seeing and he kind of just like, you know, he's he sort of just like sets his cue and he's like pulls the glove off and he's like, ah, that's good. And I'm like, and it was like this very like checked out way of saying it, not just it like it sounded like he was conceding the set. It, it literally like <laughs> I, every part of me was like, oh, okay. Like he clearly sees like he's not gonna win from here alternate. I mean, I'm an, I'm up eight to zero, he's got no chance, right? So then I'm like, okay, so I set my cue down and then I go over and I like go to shake his hand, and he's like, Well, he's like you're only at eight. I'm like, well, I thought you would give up the match. And he was like, he's like, well, I want to win too. And I'm just like, I kind of did this like double take. I'm like, okay. You know? So I, I like, obviously I just marked the game and I go up and rack the balls, but I know you were sitting there. So it was like, it was just such a strange thing. And, and, it was, and he and this ended was up the, winning like the next three or four games, but yeah. And then he rallied, then he rallied. Of course. Yeah, and, I, and, and then I like, yeah, then I was able to break and run one out, but I was like, I, it's just, it was such a strange thing because like it, usually in that position when you're that far ahead like i guess i've never really i mean when anytime that anybody's ever done that it's like they're either a player that's like so inferior in skill set that they're just like yeah 
I it's good. Like, like we're good enough. Or they're they're also like a really good player, and they're just like, yeah, like bad set. Like it's lopsided. Nothing's going my way. Like good luck to you, bro. But it just and I and I don't even know. Like I I mean I, I'm not super close to them to the point where I would. And he probably doesn't even remember. You know, he plays thousands of sets a year, but. I just I kind of want to know what his thought process was in that moment. Well, the thing is, you're only telling the end of it, Jesse, because there was a time I don't remember it being eight zero. It might have been it, you might know it might it might have been eight zero. It might have been like seven one, seven eight one, something like that. Anyway, all I remember is is that from around the time it was like five zero five one to to six zero six one, like he was just kind of like you know he was like acting. He was drinking beers, joking around with his pals. He was sprawled back, like they're drinking beers, like super lean back and chilling and not really taking, not really paying attention. Then when he gets to the table, he's kind of freewheeling, whatever. I don't really care. And he was doing this whole shenanigans about how he does. He was just acting like this is like not really interesting to him. It's like a bar table set. Who cares? And then, and then he's falling behind. And then, what, yeah, what, but to your point, then, so the culmination was when you get to the hill and he says, ah, that's good. And he takes off his glove. Like if he just said that's good, that's one thing. But when he takes off his glove in that context, you're like, oh, the gloves are you know coming off, I guess. But anyway, yeah. so so. I mean, story, I his, come... his hand was sweating. He wasn't really doing anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I was just. <laughs> <laughs> How come all your stories you're always up eight zero on Skyler? How no, no, that... <laughs> I, I do. I no, I know this one for a fact that it was eight zero because I. No, I, no, no. I, I'm just joking about yeah. it. The stories you choose to tell, it's like, oh, just gotta work that in. And I'm just. Well, I, I didn't bring up the sharky. I didn't. Bring up yeah, the, yeah. The, you know the reverse psychology, like. It's all good, baby. Hey, uh, I had half, man. I had half. Yeah. Anyway. No, that was that was just such a funny moment, man. That was it was weird, but <laughs> it's all good. So, so just remember, guys, if there's boil it all down to this, and this is any type of sharking or any type of any type of behavior that your opponent's doing that's disrupting you. Understand it, even if it doesn't look like it's intentional. Somewhere in their heart of hearts, they're doing it. That is what they've calculated to be their best shot of winning. And they're there. And the only way it works is if you don't recognize that and you let it get to you. So when you know that that's happening, just be like, all you have to do is know that that's there. That's what they, they feel like they can't outplay you. So they're going to have to disrupt your best game because your best game is too good for them. So just understand that this is a hail Mary attempt to disrupt your best game because they're, they're afraid they can't handle it. So just, you keep going, you keep going. Yeah. It's a good way to, in that one cool all right so um just took a quick break before we go on to our next topic uh, our main topic if you will um i well during our break jesse i put together a list of other 800 fargo rate players that you've defeated in the last uh handful of years i just want to make sure our listener i'm just kidding <laughs> okay all right we'll leave that in i'm not cutting that, that was out. you know what you know what's really funny though man i'll tell you this is it's not it's not a brag at all, but it's really just it's funny because I know I'm a little bit of a more like deliberate kind of slower player, especially in like you know bigger matches like that. The amount of like guys that are that are Fargo rate like seven seventy and higher that have quit on me in sets when when they've like just you know gotten to the point where they realize like all right this is not gonna like just outright quit the set is like is isn't pretty insane to me you know like. I mean, it's not a. I'm not saying it's a super long list, and I'm not gonna like just name names to do that. Be that guy, but it's, no, it's just not, it, yeah. We don't need to name the names. No, but, no, because yeah. it's yeah. It's, but it's just really strange to me because it's like the the guys who you would think should have the least amount of quit in them when they're like, no, like we got to fight to the the very end of this. It's just, I don't, it's just kind of crazy, you know. I've but, had it. I've had it happen three times. I can remember now. To be fair, when I've played guys of that caliber, uh, first of all, they usually I'm usually the one quitting them. <laughs> no, but uh, but even the sets I win are typically not so lopsided that I don't, you know, it's like if I have a you know X number of matches against 800 Fargo, they have more wins than I do off the bat, and then the wins I have are usually like everything I could do to live across the finish line. So the number of the sample size I have of like where I outran them by a huge margin and they gave up is very very slim, but. I have had that happen. I can think of a handful of times where, you know, I'm on the hill and they don't want to play the last game. I, I can, I can think of at least three examples of where I got to the hill and they gave up. And then one time um, I was up like four to one going to nine. And I think I won a game to go up four to one or five to one. And they were just like, kind of like your point. They're just like, yeah, you're actually the guy said, yeah, you're good. And I was like, okay. So I went to like, I'm like, I was confused. I just shot at the nine ball. And I'm like, what do you mean? I'm good. I already shot the nine. He's like, no, you can have the set. You can win that. And it just, it was just surprising. So yeah, it does happen, but, uh, um, yeah. yeah, but, uh, 
We're I, we're the best players. We're the best. Have you ever given up player. when you're down? When the guys on the I can't remember ever. And I honestly, man, I can't remember. Are we talking about in pool or in life? Because I got to see how long the list. Oh. Well, we're not going to bring marriage up into this. Okay, okay, yeah. Uh, no, I, I've well, never. I don't think I've ever not finished a set. I can't remember. I guess I'm just. Maybe, maybe, yeah. maybe that's why I'm not better. Maybe if I started conceding sets, I'd get my Fargo up to 800. I'm trying to think if there's like, if there's times and how many times I've done that out of like just defeat. I know that I've done that a couple of times where I just realized that mentally I just wasn't in pool and it, it had nothing to do with like the other player or like, you know, I was just like, yeah, I just like, I don't even like, I don't want to play. Like I, it's, you know, and it, it wasn't in like super meaningful sets. Obviously I wouldn't, wouldn't do yeah, that. Yeah. If it was like, things but it you know I, I could think of it in like a weekly term or something where i just realized a couple sets in i'm just like yeah i just this is not what i want to do in my night so you're good like and trust me when we play jesse makes me shoot every ball yeah, there's he hasn't conceded if he scratched on the hill hill nine ball he would make me spot it and take ball in hand this guy doesn't give me an inch though so. well i i didn't want our friendship to be that way but ever since you almost rattled that 10 ball like 12 years ago i just i <laughs> I don't know. I feel like you're going to dog it. <laughs> I understand, man. I understand. Yeah. But uh, that's the oh, that's the one that fell. Is that the one you're talking about? Okay. I'm just trying to make sure. I remember. <laughs> that was probably pretty good, man. Okay. <laughs> so, all right. So here's our topic. Here's what I want to talk about. Um, there. Why don't you introduce this topic? You know what we're going to talk about. Yeah. So it's essentially um, the, like the way that we've kind of talked about it because we we have brought this up on a on a different phone call just you know not going super deep dive but it's going to involve essentially like the idea of like two-way shots and also the idea of like focusing on um focusing on generating the highest like ev or expected value uh shot or or move out of each situation and not like so in other words not creating leaks in your game like not giving up freebies not giving up percentages over like mental laps or just, you know, poor decision-making. So, so let me define EV and expected value. So I was using blackjack as an example earlier. Let's talk about blackjack and basic strategy. Uh, I'm going to assume that people at least know the rules to blackjack, play to 21 points, whatever. Anyway, <laughs> if you didn't know it now, you know, it. that's a, that's <laughs> a all encompassing primer and you're ready to go to Vegas and rain man it up. Okay. Um, Basic strategy suggests that for every situation, there's an optimal play. You know, if you have a 12, you're supposed to hit against the dealer's two, uh, but you're not supposed to hit against the dealer's three. Um, you know, things like this. Um, you hit against, you know, whatever. So so the point is, is that if you don't do the right play, you're giving up some equity. So if you play blackjack and you play optimal basic strategy, depending on the number of decks and the exact rules that the casino has, you're generally going to be pretty close to 50-50. You know, meaning you're, you're going to break even with the casino. Now they might have a one or 2% edge, uh, but it's usually a very, very small edge, depending on, again, there's different rules. And I'm not getting into counting. That's not where we're going with this. But if you deviate from those optimal plays, you give up equity. And sometimes you can make a slightly suboptimal play, like standing on a 12 against the dealer's two might be negative expected value, but it's not horrible. But... If you were to stand on a 12 against a dealer's face card, that would be criminal. You're just punting away a lot of it. So there's times you make a little bit of a suboptimal play and you're just giving away a few pennies on your bet on average. And then there's other times when you're just tearing up money. And so that's what expected value or optimizing your decisions are. And so what we're talking about is when you're playing pool and you're in a situation where do you play offense? Do you play defense? Do you play a two-way shot? Those are kind of the options. And they're not three options. It's a spectrum. You can play, you can play all offense where you don't even care about safe, all defense, where you don't care about anything about there's no chance to score. But with your two-way shots, there's a there's a blend. You could play a very offensive shot, but you're just playing it at a speed to where if you miss, you know, it might work out for you. But you're really trying to go offense and you're just going offense with a certain speed in mind just to give yourself a little luck equity if you don't make it. But then there's other times when you're playing really as a safety, you're really planning this to be a defensive shot, but there is a chance that maybe 
you make the nine, or maybe there is a chance at two rails in that pocket or something, but really you're playing defense. So it's not just one of three things, offense, defense, two-way shot. It's a spectrum of, are you leaning really offensively? Are you leaning really defensively or where in between? And why is this a, why when people are in these marginal situations, do people burn up so much equity, Jesse? Probably could be a lot of factors. I mean, obviously the dealing with pressure or, you know, just like, overall composure in your your pool game is probably the the biggest reason um there's also the possibility that in certain situations people just don't really know what to do so i mean i guess the reason is going to probably depend on uh like your your skill level to begin with as well but i i think that's 100 percent right i think that you can i was thinking about two things one you can only do what you've learned and you know what you can only use the tools you've built so definitely the tools developing the right toolbox of moving uh, is going to be a big part of having options and having the right options. And then the other thing you mentioned was the pressure. And I want to start with this because when it comes to a podcast, we're probably not going to be able to get into the moving part is, you know, we're not teaching a moving class here. Uh, we can talk a little bit about where people can go to learn that stuff, but, but let's talk about the pressure and why under pressure people make bad choices sure so you want to start it off or you want me to uh you go first because i always go too long <laughs> okay yeah i mean people make obviously when they're under pressure a lot of times like it's it's a weird like subconscious mindset and we you and i have both been through this for sure you almost have this thing where it's like you just want the situation to be done with like you the adrenaline's pumping you're you're in a state of like severe discomfort physically and mentally and you're just like ah, i just want this done with just pull the trigger and like let the result re results going to be what it's going to be but i just want out of here and i feel like that is a that that's like the big root of of where this all starts under pressure you know so, so that's that's fight or but, flight so what you're talking about is fight or flight when people get into a really uncomfortable situation they want to escape that situation even if they lose they want it to be over with and did you, I've been talking a lot about poker tonight. Did you hear Daniel DeGranu on the Lex Friedman podcast? I did not know. Okay. So he was talking about his, you know, one of his favorite hands was, uh, of course, I'm sure you know the, uh, the Scotty Wynn hand where he wins the championship and he, and he says to his opponent, you called now, it's going to be all over, baby. Okay. Remember that? Yeah. So what, what I never thought about this before because basically Scotty Wynn, is he's got the slick back hair and he's drinking a big little golden or something. And he's just, and he makes this all in, he puts their heads up for the title. He puts his opponent all in and his opponent's thinking about it. And he says, you call now it's going to be all over baby. And I always thought he was just table talk goading his opponent into making a call. But what Daniel said was it, it was like, he took it like it was a subconscious thing where his opponent had been, it was an amateur player that had never played for these stakes before. And they were going through hours of just painstaking, high pressure, and huge decisions. And they just, and so there was a part of that guy that just didn't want to have to be doing this anymore. And so somehow his subconscious, when he heard like, you just call and it could be over. It could just be over one way or another. Yeah. We'll just figure it out right now. So if you're debating on whether or not it's a good call or bad call, well, at least if you call, we're going to get this sorted out real quick. And that right. there was maybe part of them that really just wanted it over with. And that, and so Daniel thought that it was almost like a hypnotic suggestion to just escape the situation. And the guy That's called and it was all over. He lost. And so anyway, very similar. When people are in high pressure situations, they want it over with. And so, yeah. 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 So I think, you know, yeah, I think that is like the the main thing that, or, or it's at least one of the first things that people go through. Right. And then, I think as people's skill levels get better, you, I don't know if you necessarily like learn how to not feel that, that fight or flight, like inner feeling, but you, you have enough new like logic and, and, uh, and, and knowledge where you're like, well, yes, I may still be feeling that, but I know that I can't just blast this ball. Like I know that like, you know, trying to bank this ball one rail up and play safe is better than, just like closing my eyes and firing at the ball. So you kind of start to mix in, you know, a little bit more uh, strategy, if you so will. But let me talk about that. Cause I think that's a big deal. Like 
we're only as good as our questions and we're only as good as our thought process. And there are two things that I think people say a lot to themselves that lead people to this kind of all or nothing Hail Mary attempts. And so one thing that uh, a saying that almost, you know, of course, I forget that I'm talking to people here on the podcast that might be new to pool that are just starting to take it seriously. So I've heard this for 30 plus years, but maybe somebody has never heard this before. When you have a difficult shot and a difficult safety, take the difficult shot because if you make it, at least you win. And if you miss it, you can always get lucky. And, you know, so there's a reason for that is when you're, when your safety is as hard as your shot, take the shot. The reason being, if you take the shot, you can make it. And if you make it, you win. And if you miss it, you might still get lucky and leave them tough. You don't necessarily always lose. Whereas when you play the safety, if you play a good safe, you don't necessarily win. They get to kick out of it or you know, who knows, or jump out of it or do something. And if you mess it up, you still have as good of a chance of losing, if not, you know, more. So basically there's an old cliche that says when you're in doubt between offense and defense, go offense. That's a pretty common saying. And on the surface, it sounds good. And then the other thing that people know is that sometimes they're in a spot, especially playing bar table eight ball, where if you run down to the eight ball and the opponent's got balls hanging on pockets and everything's open, it's like, if you let them to the table, you're at a, you're not going to like play a safety and out move them at this point because they've got all their soldiers. They got too many options. And, and so it's almost like you're in the spot where you can get into spots playing eight ball where it's like, well, if they get to the table, they're pretty much going to win. And so in those spots, people understand that like I, any, any attempt, I just have to make, figure out some possible way that the eight ball might be able to go into a pocket somewhere. And I just got to go all in because if it doesn't go, I'm going to lose anyway. So I got nothing to lose. Let's just go all in and try to make this eight, three rails of a side. So to recap, when the shot is as tough as the, you know, when the safety is as tough as the shot, shoot the shot. And when you're down to the eight ball and your opponent's going to win, if they get to the table, you got to go all in. So those are two things that people know or two situations that people have kind of like, those are their little toolbox of thoughts. Mm -hmm. And then the problem is that they overuse it way too much that they go to i i will make the statement that i think people go into all out desk people go into desperation mode way too often and way too early way too much of the time i would agree with that yeah i think that's it's probably pretty accurate yeah so for example on that eight ball where they've run down to the eight ball maybe you are all in maybe you are all in where if they get to the table they're probably going to win and so you've got to go for this long rail kick but that doesn't mean that there might not be a speed that you can kick it at to where if you kick it, there's a chance if it doesn't go, it can maybe block the pocket or tie something up that's nearby or that, that you can't, you know, or if you're going to play a bank on the eight, that doesn't mean that you can't play a bank on the eight and, and kind of drag the cue ball, you know, near the corner pocket or where they're going to be shooting out of the jaws and any, you know, maybe, maybe you get them on the rail or leave a distance where it makes them at least earn it. Because guess what? They're thinking about how, if I get to the table, I win. And they're expecting you to get up and miss and leave them a bunch of easy shots. And so maybe you can drag them into the corner. And, you know, they happen to get frozen on top of a ball or something. It's like, I don't know, man. There's just anything that you can do to create opportunity to get something good to happen. So if you're just thinking, well, I've lost, I might as well go all in. You might not notice that you could play the kick at a certain speed or that you could. It's just not, that's just not the full way to think. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say that that's kind of just allowing, like we were talking about earlier, just allowing like the results uh, mindset to kind of come in too, you know, because you're already like, yeah, like you're already kind of fearful of like the worst case scenario, which is that you're going to kick this poorly or you're going to, you know, bank the shot poorly and, and miss. And then you've already just chalked it up to assume that you're going to lose or the worst case. So, yeah, I mean, trying to just, it all just kind of wraps back around, man. You got to work on your mindset and, and try to keep as uh, even keel as possible. So. so I'm trying to think through a podcast of like, because we, what we did and what kind of why this is on our minds is we did a video review uh, and I did this, I posted it on for my students that are, have done three day boot camps with me. We have a little group uh, under my, it's a private group I have on my Facebook for my grad, my, my student, my boot camp graduates, where we can continue to kind of talk about our pool journey and, coach and develop ourselves anyway um so i did this video review 
on end games and i and i did one with jesse on the same end games to hear his thoughts and when i say end games i mean like nine ball where there's like the seven eight nine or just the eight nine or just the nine and somebody's got at the table where they don't really have a good shot but they don't really have a good save like what do you do here and interestingly enough i stumbled across just between when we did the video and when we did uh when we we're having this call like in the last couple of days I stumbled across like a journal entry I made from 15 years ago where I was watching some other match and I was amazed at how both players ran out well, but it seemed like, and both players played good defense when they had like good defensive plays, but in the marginal spots where it was like, there's nothing, they're at the table, they can hit the ball, but there's nothing really good they can do with it. One guy was finding a way to really, optimize those opportunities and make, you know, find ways to leave the other guy awkward and make him earn it. Whereas the other guy was just kind of not really as good in those in between or spots. And he would either go for wild offensive shots or just didn't really know how to be effective from there. And that, I just remember being like, really, it stood out to me in this match. I was watching that, like, that was what sold the match. This guy won handily. And it was just what he was doing with those in between spots. So it stood out to me from, that was a, just a random journal entry. I just saw, but um, <clears throat> we did this video review the other day on end games, and there was one player at the table that had a lot of shots come up in a very short order where he didn't really know what to do. And he was just going all out offense again and again and again, and it didn't work well for him. And so that's kind of what made us want to talk about this. <clears throat> so how do you know? if you should like go offense or defense or like what, I mean, do you have any tips that you could use when you're not at the table to try to sort out which way to go? Well, like you said earlier, the, the general thing is, you know, if, <laughs> if you've kind of weighed the percentages for yourself, based on your, like your skill set and your knowledge and you can, I mean, not just like, you're like, yep, it's, it's 50, 50, not everything's 50, 50, but assuming that it is 50, 50, then yes, of course you want to, you know, push more towards the side of offense because at least, you're giving yourself a chance to win, right? But yeah, I mean, that would like my general rule would just be like anytime it starts to sway one way or another, like, you know, I would say if it's 60 40, then it's clearly like you should go with the, the 60%, right? Um, but there's no like exact science, there's not even like a good like general rule that's gonna like, you know, be a that's gonna cover it all because there's so many like nuanced things to it, you know? Um, like I was thinking about that four ball runner that you were talking about the other day, you know, like, or that we did on the video review the other day. And, and that thing, like, there's a lot of players that would watch that and listen to what we had to say. And I feel like they would get some stuff out of that. But if it, it's one of those things where you almost have to have already shot each one of those shots in 30 different ways to see all the different results to really grasp why we're, why we're talking about that. You know what I mean? Because you don't so no, yeah this is back to knowing the moves and having experience yeah, yeah. if you don't and have the moves and the experience it's hard to weigh out the percentages right and of course what your percentages are are going to be different exactly from a yeah guy who hasn't shot like shots. you just don't know what you don't know which is why it's, you just got to put in the you got to put in the time and you have to like work on those situations and i mean that, that's why i practice so, so let me, important, let me, right so yeah but regardless of what tools they have and what percentages they have one thing is true that you should shoot if it's even with, but let's, let's example, let's look at why. And I haven't done this before. This might end up being like, just give somebody a headache, but I don't think so. I'm going to try to keep this high level. Suppose that we talk about like, a, a, like if you're going to run this out a hundred times, sure. how it's going to work out. And let's just suppose you have a, an end game where the nine balls on the middle of the end rail and the cue balls on the spot on the other end of the table. And the nine yep. ball's not frozen. It's a couple balls off the rail where you can bank it. Here's a way that you can kind of run some stats on this. You could say, what is my, if I go all in, like if I don't worry about safety at all, let's, what is my make percentage on this bank under pressure? And maybe you look at that bank. I don't want to embarrass myself, but I would say that if it's middle of the end rail from the spot and I'm all in on making that bank under pressure, I mean, I'm thinking I'm probably at least 25%, but no more than 35%. I'm probably like 25 to 30% is probably my make percentage. And if it's the pressure's right, it could be 25. Uh, if I'm 
if things are going well, maybe it hits 30, 35, but I, I'm thinking 25 to 30 percent make percentage. Does that seem reasonable? It does. Yeah. Right away. I was like, yeah, I was like, man, I wouldn't want to be too confident. I would say like the 20 to 30 range because you're talking about pressure spots. So yeah. yeah like, it's, it, you know, it's just making now on a Valley bar table. It's a little different, but yeah. okay. Let's just say it was 25%. Great. We're pretty close. So that means that every single time you make that nine, you win that game. So 25 games, you've already won. But the question is, what happens the 75 times you miss it? You don't lose every one of those games. Sometimes you get away with it. You know, you bank it and it just banks and it leaves them tough or they just dog the shot somehow. So the question is, what? let's just suppose that you go all in on the bank and on average, you leave them a pretty open shot and they make it most of the time. But some of the time they're going to mess it up. So you might win another 10 games of course, this goes back and forth. They might leave you tough on the times they mess it up, and you might dog it back and all this. But let's just say that out of the 75 times you miss the bank, maybe you get lucky and end up winning five to 10 of those. So you win 25, and then you win another eight more that you got kind of lucky on, and the guy gave it back to you. So you end up winning 33 out of 100. Fantastic. Now let's compare that with some alternate strategies. Suppose you try to play a really weak safety. And instead of banking at that ball, you try to just like slow roll it from distance and ship them side rail to side rail, which isn't, by the way, like under the right circumstances, I'm not even saying that there's not a time and place. But if, if, you, if you play a weak safety, the reason that that's a problem is that you don't win any of the games immediately. You, you've taken that 25 games that you already that you made the nine and those go to zero. Yeah. So now out of the, now a hundred of the times you're letting them back to the table. Well, you were winning 33 out of hundred before. So you have to now get back to the table and win more than 33. But the problem is they're going to be close to the ball. They're going to play a bank or a safety back. And, and I'll tell you what they, it might, they might be able to, you know, take a shot. They might play a two way shot where they make the bank half the time and leave you really tough half the time. And it could get, it could get really sideways. And, and that's assuming that you laid your safety down. And I forgot about the fact that when you slow roll butt that safety, there's going to be a quarter of those times that you roll off or you miss hit it and sell out a shot directly in where they just get to automatically win. So if you if you play that safety a hundred times, twenty five of the, you know twenty five of those times you're going to mess up that safety and leave them a shot on the corner or the side. Boom, you've just lost twenty five. And then on the other seventy five, they're going to win at least half the games by moving or banking and, and out moving you from there. So they're going to win another 33 plus the 25 that you just did sell out They're They're all of a sudden, I, I, I probably did. It's probably, I probably did the math the wrong way to where they're, it's about the same or maybe whatever. But the point is when you give up those 25 games that you could immediately win, it's a huge loss of offensive equity. Uh, and so, so it's just playing a marginal safety, giving up all your offense to play a marginal safety. It's really not a good move. I'm not going to go into the numbers like that again. I can see that that's going to get too messy, but this is kind of how I, you know, I don't think about all these numbers at the table, but like when you're kind of weighing these things out, you're asking yourself, how much of the time can I immediately win? And what percentage of the time that I let them back to the table? Can I win? Does that, and, and maxing out those two numbers, immediate wins plus returns to the table. If I don't win immediately, add mm -hmm. that up and you want those numbers to be as big as you can. And so in general, you don't want to give up a huge offensive equity, because the defensive equity will never always work. Whereas the ball going in always gets you a win. Does that, does that make sense? It, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. And uh, not to backpedal too much, but when you originally asked me like, what's a good, uh, what was the first question? You basically asked me like, what would be a good like uh, guidance to give people, right? A good, any yeah, tip. Yeah. The other thing I was going to quickly say is if, if you're kind of like really unsure what to do, or if you you're unsure if the percentages are like high enough in your favor to go offensive, let's say, then always a good thing to think about is just like if you have an idea of where the cue ball is going to end up, assuming that you make this ball, like do you love that position from there? Like do you love your is is that set you up for an even better safety or potentially an easy run out, or is it just going to be just as hard of a scenario? You know, yeah, and it doesn't I, even. I mean, yeah, it, it sounds like very elementary, but I feel like there's a lot of people who probably don't really, really like take the extra step to to think that through, you know? So, yeah, it's like, well, we're, you're almost asking what's the risk? What's the reward? Uh, yeah. What do I get if I make this successfully? Okay. But right now, I just don't want to, I, I want to just, I kind of overcomplicate it. So I want to bring it back. 
the reason I was I was trying to make a specific case, which is that um, that giving up offense, a healthy offensive equity, the reason why you should go offense when it's close is because if you're 50-50 to make the shot and you're 50-50 to play a safety, if you give up 50% of your offensive equity, you know, so thinking about that nine ball, if we have a nine ball shot where we're 50% to make it, well, we're going to make it 50 times. And then I have to, you know, some of the time we miss, we might win anyway. We're probably going to win like 60 to 70 games out of a hundred. Right. And to give up all 50 of those immediate makes to play that safety. If that safety doesn't win you the game, 80 out of a hundred times, you're burning money to play right. defense there. And that's why anytime you have 50% offense, it's like you kind of have to at least get your offense. But when your offense starts getting really low, like 20% and less or 25% and less, 20%, you you could still fire. But now there's some questions you can ask, like what speed can I play this with? Or is there a way I can play this to where I'm not just burning up money? You know, like I, I don't, uh, how do I, how do I give myself a good chance that those 75 misses that might be tougher than others? So like on that long rail bank, if you long rail bank it, short like uh where it goes to the app you know so you're banking it to the corner but it hits the end rail so it, it goes end rail and then it hits the second end rail well then it's going to bounce back up along the side rail and unless it stops right in front of the side pocket there's a very good chance that it bounces two rails and leaves it on the rail where they're going to be the cue ball usually goes over the other side rail you might end up leaving them a bank or a very difficult cut so if you undercut that bank good a lot of good things can happen whereas if you overcut the bank now the ball comes off the headrail, comes off the side rail, and it basically bounces out in front of and out in the space. And you're always going to leave a straight in, not a straight in shot, but you're always going to leave a direct shot at the pocket. So for for example, in that spot where you're you know long banking the ball, you could say, now you've got a choice. You can play all safety and bunt split the balls. We talked about that. You know you're giving up too much offensive equity. But if you go all in on the bank without any thought about speed or which side of the pocket you want to miss on you're giving up a lot of defensive equity. So a good shot there is to play the bank, but play it at the at just a hair, try to err on the short side if you miss, and play it at a speed to where if you miss, the ball bounces off the end rail by about three feet, by off the second end rail by three feet. You're basically, now you still will make 25 out of 100 because you're going to make it the same amount. You're, you know, you're not really trying to miss it. You're just favoring one side, but the, the whole reason we do that is we're not so accurate that we're going to be that accurate anyway. So, but then you're just going to win out of the times you miss instead of winning 10 out of 75, you might legit win 30 out of 75 or 25 out of 75. And now all of a sudden right. you take the spot where you look like you're an underdog and you make it even money or even a little favor. And so, so what we're trying to do is when you have good offense when, when you have a lot of offense, 50% or better, you know, oftentimes you just max it out. When you have reasonable offense, like 25% or better, you want to, you don't want to give up your offensive equity, but you do want to start thinking about what speeds and size of the pocket you can miss on that might result in a good miss. And at some point, if your offensive equity drops too low, like 5% or 10% or less than 10%, at some point it's so little that you almost want to just max out your defensive equity and try to do what you can to play a speed and cue ball position to leave them as tough as you can, because giving a 5% offense to, to, to get better defense is probably worth it at that point. So these are not set in stone. Obviously it depends on, well, how good is your defensive option and all this stuff. It's very, 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 very subjective. Um, but if you at least understand that there's a spectrum, when you're confident in the shot, go all in on the shot. If you're, if it's a tester shot, you're not that confident in start thinking about, you know, but it's a, it's a good shot. You want to max out your equity, you know, go for it, but think about the speeds and directions you want to miss on as that equity gets narrower and narrower, you can actually start planning on the miss and just giving yourself that little shot. If it goes, it goes, but I'm kind of planning on the miss. And at some point you play all out safety. So you've got to kind of look at it as a spectrum and it all comes down to, you know, how confident you are in the shot. So I just tend to think that people go into desperation mode and they treat too many of these shots as if they just write off the, the defensive equity they have and just go all in. So I just wanted people, I want, and, and that's because again, you're only as good as your thought process. And if people's only thought process is if you're in a tough spot, go for it. 
and you might as well go all on it. If that's their only thought process, I wanted to give them a thought process that might give them some, some yeah, ways of that's... looking at it. Yeah. No, I think that's a pretty good way to put it. Where can they learn this stuff, Jesse? Where can they learn the actual moves and like like the shot I just described? You know, long rail banking the ball. Don't bank it at pocket speed. If you're a one pocket player and you're playing nine ball on your end rail to end rail, don't pocket speed the ball. This is you, it doesn't do you any good to hang the ball in your pocket. Play it, bank it an inch short of the corner, and have it bounce off the end rail three diamonds and watch what you leave them. Yeah. Uh, how do you learn stuff like that? Well, of course you. I mean, you you have to see it, right? You have to see it play out. I mean, you know, I'm not going to like say that you and I are going to spend a bunch of time doing stuff like that, but I mean, but maybe we'll put some stuff up. I'm sure there's plenty of content out there too that, that talks about different scenarios, but I would just say when you're watching pool and you're watching tournaments, pay attention to stuff that's like just not the standard runouts, you know, like when they, for instance, when they're like rolling down for the seven and they accidentally like, clip the eight coming across the center of the table and they just get funny like watch how they play it out from there and 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 i mean honestly there are some very good commentators out there we know that so like pay attention to what they're saying and and like if, if they suggest well you know you could there's really only a couple things you could do here or like watch the speed that they hit it watch if they you know just really pay attention to the detail of, of how they play those situations i don't know i mean there's really there's not like a book to to read right where you're going to learn everything at once yeah. just paying attention really and then of course if you see uh some scenarios or if you're in some scenarios yourself that you realize that like maybe didn't play out in your favor we're just kind of you just didn't have a good feeling walking away from it i mean just set it up and and mess around with it you know try some different things and and start to see what what the higher percentage shots are yeah and uh what you just said there uh, that's what i was going to say so you mentioned paying attention but I would say it's almost like I always think about it this way. You know, I, there's 100 pool players. Do you want to be the bottom of the pack, the middle of the pack, the top 10%, number one? Where do you want to be in the pack? And then ask yourself what everybody else does and understand you can be number one out of 100. You just have to do more than the other 99. So when, when it comes to paying attention, half your competition doesn't pay attention. So if you start paying attention, you're not it's good for you. You're in the middle of the pack, but guess what? Half the guys are actually going to their table and setting up these shots and working on them. Maybe not half, but another 30% of them are. So now if you want to be in the top 20%, what you got to do is when you see that spot come up, don't just be like, Oh, that's cool. What he did there. I didn't think of that. Pause it, set it up on your table, shoot it, shoot it until it works have it fail. If it fails, which side do you fail on? Is it, oh boy, man, it sure is easy to, you know, to, to, to make that mistake or, you know, to bank it, you know, whatever this way, or it's, it's just certain speeds, or I have a tendency to let off on my stroke because I'm worried about my speed and I decelerate or just play with that shot until you see how it works and where it breaks and get some experience and feel and move them around a little bit and see how it, where does it break down and, you know, spend half an hour, 15 minutes to half an hour on that one shot and variations of that shot and getting to know that shot. And now you have a shot that you really know. And the beautiful part is if you do that, I'm not talking about doing that once a day. I'm not even talking about doing that once a week. If somebody did that once a month, that they spent half an hour working on one shot that they saw come up at a game in a year's time, they'd have worked on 10 different maneuvers. And I've, I've been teaching pool. And of course, you can come take a boot camp. I, I, I teach this stuff too, but there's only so many ways to move the balls around the table. And it's funny that when you start in the beginning, it seems like it's infinite, man. These balls could be anywhere and you could do anything, but really it's like, there's like, I'm not going to say there's 12 moves or 10 moves, but what I will say is if I teach somebody 10 moves, that will encompass like 80 to 90% of the situations they're going to reach. For sure. And then if I, and if I could teach them 12 to 15, now they're up to like 95% of the situations that come up. And so it's like, there are certain ways of moving the balls around that come up again and again and again and again and again. And so if you figure out which are like the really most common ones and then practice those and get to know where they break and where they work and why, oh my gosh. So if that's why I say you don't have to do more than one a month because if you're looking at the right stuff and practicing it a little bit and then trying it out and using them in games, within a year's time, you're going to be the best mover in your league and one of the better tournament players around. You know, it's just that's just the way it works. And so... But, so my point is, pay attention will get you to the middle of the pack. 
But if you set up and work on one a month, that's what's going to get you in the top 10 to 20%. And then from there, it's going to be obviously competitive experience, talking to players, asking them what they would do here. Really, you know, there's different things you can do to kind of drill. It starts getting harder and harder as you get closer to that last 5%. But but you can get a long way towards the top by paying attention and then and then getting off your rear and actually setting up the balls and playing with them and getting to know those. And then as far as content creators, um, so yeah, there's a watching pool is a huge one, you know, watching pro pool and and really asking yourself what they would do and pausing it. And then, and then seeing what they do and setting it up. Like that's huge. Another one is as far as creators, uh, Neil Spann and Jasmine Ocean, both are doing some good stuff with some good moves. I know uh, Sharavari does some stuff. Uh, little Chris does some stuff. I'm going to be doing some stuff with little Chris. I haven't even told him this yet, but I'm going to be doing our end games. Got me excited. I'm going to be doing some, uh, some, some training with Chris and some stuff with Chris on these uh, that we'll probably publish on his channel. Uh, you and I might do some stuff, but anyway, um, so there's a few content creators I named and watching pool, asking your top players, if you get into a tough spot, what they would do in a spot and playing it around, getting off your rear and actually putting it into action, watching these content creators. And of course uh, I'm here if you want to train. So those are some ways because you're, yeah, you're, you're as only as good as your thought process and your, your actual tool bag. Yeah. I was going to say too, like, you know, I mean, when I was like much younger getting into pool, it, of course my focus level for the game was much different because it was like the world to me. Right. Like this, I didn't really care about school at the time. I just wanted to focus on pool, but uh, yeah, I, I remember I spent so much time watching uh, like nine ball matches on, on YouTube. I mean, that was before 10 ball really became a thing. And these were like older U S open matches or whatever. And I would like, I mean, I would do that, as, you know, while I was on the computer anyways. And, and I wasn't like, you know, watching every single shot, but I always like did sort of have it on in the background. I was paying attention. And I remember seeing some like interesting shots, you know, where I like I, my skill set wasn't that high, but like one of the main things I remember um, learning was like there was a and I'd have to like set it up to really show this. But like there was a shot where like at that time, my skill set, like I felt the most confident just kind of like rolling the ball in with top and then going to the end rail and coming back out towards the center. I was like, at least I'll have a shot. And then I started to realize that that's the incorrect way to play it. And you're supposed to like kind of drag punch the ball, like, you know, end rail and then to the long rail to come out back out of the corner back towards the center, because it gives you like a, you know, you're, then you're coming into the next ball, then into the next angle. And of, of course now it's like, it sounds stupid to say it, but like there was a time when I didn't really, like, I didn't really think of pool that way. I was just like, as long as I make my ball, I still have a chance to to keep going on and, and have a chance to run on win, you know? Whereas, like, maybe I had to learn how to take a, a slightly harder stroke shot just because it was the the right shot. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, I don't know yeah, if that, yeah. like, exactly how that applies to our, well, it's, our thing it's here. A very, but... it's, a, it's an example of how you're only as good as your thought process and your techniques and your tools. And it just made me realize, like, I just – People, I just wish people could see it because it's so obvious when you think about anything else. Like if, if somebody was going to learn to manufacture or or like say they had to build, I don't know, like rocket ships or something, or they're going to, you know, work at SpaceX or something and build, they're going to, they, it's like if somebody wanted to learn how to build a rocket, who do you want to bet on? Do you want to bet on the guy that doesn't watch any videos, study, read any books? He's just going to go tinker around with parts and hopefully figure out, I know I want it to fly you don't have to be a genius to realize that's not going to work. Now, yeah. what about the guy? What about the guy that just kind of watches passively as others build their rockets, like at Washington rocket builders, build rockets. Like that's cool. You're going to learn a lot watching them do it. Um, for sure. That you're light years ahead of, of the people that don't do that. And if you read a few books and watch a few videos, that's really good. But now compare that to somebody that's like interning and building rockets under the guidance of somebody that knows how to assemble rockets. I mean, there's just like, obviously that's just going to give you a whole nother level of, of, and that doesn't have to be me. I'm not just plugging my boot camps. It could also mean why I'm so fanatical about people getting to competitions and playing with good players and having lunch with those players and setting up shots and shooting shots and playing scotch doubles in between matches and talking about what to do here and what to do there. And, and then what would you do with this comes up and, you know, and then hearing them explain why, because you could see it, but then having them explain why and really go deep diving into and then showing you how it fails and why failing this way works out better. And then you learn these things. You're like, Oh, wow. It's just, 
having the chance to work with better players, whether it's an instructor or just a better player that's just going to spend a few minutes with you as you hit balls around, like we learn it's a, it's a trade pools, a trade. And I mean, you, you have to, like, if you want to learn the business, it really, you, the, the more you can hang out with and spend time with and, and, and learn from the people that know the trade, it's going to go better. So for first thing, don't be the guy that doesn't read the books and watch the videos, read the books, watch the videos, and then listen to the commentary then set it up and try it. But then you've mm-hmm. got to find ways to rub elbows and, and shake hands with people that are better than you. And if that means taking some hard losses or taking a trip to Minnesota, whatever you have to do, you have to, you have to learn the trade. Uh, it's just too hard to learn trial and error. Yeah. And I was just, I know you weren't trying to plug yourself there too, too hard, but I was going to say. I uh, mean, Skylar Woodward too one time, by the way. <laughs> that's funny. He, he uh, was the wild card. He was the wild card at Wisconsin. And oh in the first, he was the first pick at the Karen room. And he had me down two nothing going to nine playing 10 ball. And I beat him nine games in a row. I beat him nine to two. And so that was the first round. So that was a tough draw for me, but then it turned out to be a tough draw for him. So I just want everybody to know that, yeah. you know, while we're, while we're name dropping about Pool Scott, bootcamp.com. MNPoolBootCamp.com. Okay. Sorry. No, I, well, yeah. I was just going to say that, you know, I think another mistake that somebody can make too, is just assuming that like the person or whatever, like uh avenue that you're taking, like the, the, like wherever you're learning from, you just assume that, you found like the golden ticket is like this person or this, uh, this community knows everything. And, and as long as I pay attention to this, like I'm going to skyrocket and get here. You know what I mean? Because the issue is, is that like, you know, like you're a great player, obviously I'm a great player, but like if I came as a new pool player to learn from you, like I don't realize that you didn't learn all your stuff. Like what, like on one, you know, s- smooth path, right? Like you picked up so many little things from so many random people and you probably learned stuff along the way from people that you would have like you, you would know you would never want to learn stuff from you know but it was just by accident almost right like they hit a specific shot a certain way and it, that that experience kind of made you think about those shots differently or whatever you know i mean i'm probably reaching a little bit too far here but you get you know, the you're, you're like, 100 right i mean i that's why one of my favorite things to do is like i love the, like watching guys like alex peggy lion where they're just like tinkerers they're always just like how do these shots work and how do you, you know, all these goofy shots that are like, well, you would never use that in a game or look at this trick shot or look at what you can make the balls do or like all these little techniques that you might think like, well, you would never use that, but then stuff comes up. And when you're, see, when you're playing a shot in a pocket, you might not use some of these crazy things, but when, when you're playing defense, you know, you're not limited by having to make a ball in the pocket. So that gives you a lot more creativity about where you can play your cue ball and what speeds and hits you can use. And there's a lot of, that's why people love three cushion billiards in one pocket. There's stuff that comes up in those games that you would never do in a nine ball game. And so you get to use a whole another world of creative maneuvers that are fun to try and fun to pull off. And so defense is a little bit like that. Like when you're playing straight pool, you're just shooting a ball in the corner or scraping a pack. But when you're playing nine ball and you're playing defense, you might, you might shoot, you know, a three, like how often in straight pool do you three rail a ball at the side pocket as a two-way shot, you know, but it, that's one of my, you know, it's a, everybody, once you learn that shot, it's just a fun one to try, you know what I mean? And it's like, I don't know. So the point is uh, tinkering around. Yeah. So like every time I get together with players, I always love watching, like, show me something I haven't seen before. That's what I always love asking people. Show me something I haven't seen before on the pool table, because sometimes people show me something I haven't seen before. And I'm like, that's pretty fun and exciting. And then, and then it turns out you can use it sometimes, you know? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. It's interesting, man. It's it's weird to look back and, and think about like how to learn pool. You know, I, I know you teach pool, but it's just, it, it's just, it's a weird thing, man. You look back and you realize like all the years you've been through and like where you, where you are now compared to where you started. It's just, yeah. it's kind and of it's fascinating. Like, man. It's a lot like parenting. You look at that road and you're like, it's such a long road. For a minute, you feel kind of bad, like, oh, you poor son of a gun. You got to go down that road. And then you realize that's only a sad thing if the road is unpleasant and there's a payoff at the end that they might not reach. But once you realize that, like, oh, wait a minute, there's really nothing on the end that they're missing out of. And it actually the road is a lot of fun. Then you get to be excited. Like, you, it's not that you have to do this. You get to do this. You get to see these shots for the first time. And you get to, right. you know, what I would love to the you know to have those i mean those experiences are what made my pool journey you know, so meaningful to me so uh i don't 
you know, that's just nothing but joy for somebody to look forward to as long as they're enjoying the journey. So yeah. yeah. Cool. 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 All right, I'm going to go to bed because I got to drive 17 hours tomorrow. <laughs> so. Oh, okay. Sounds good. Well, yeah. Good luck down there. And yes, uh, sir. hopefully I don't draw sky, by the way, sky is beating me every other time we play. So <laughs> I'll okay. work that in, including oh. that YouTube match where he jumps in back to back balls. Bill oh, yeah, that, that one's pretty terrible. <laughs> that one's rough. So, all right. You can watch it in 3d uh, coming, coming to IMAX near you. All right. All Jesse, right. Thanks for joining. Yep. Yeah. Thanks for having me.